Good morning, Open Bible Church. Uh, great to gather with you again online. I don't know if you know this or not, but this is actually week 13. Week 13 that we've had to go online and do it this way. But we are still grateful. We can't wait to gather with you again here uh, at some level uh, soon, hopefully in the Lord's will and his time. Um, but um, for now, this is what we have. Uh, we trust that this service will be a blessing to you and an encouragement to you in your walk with Christ this week. Um, speaking of our church family, we have uh, lots of occasions to celebrate in your lives, birthdays and anniversaries, both this past week and we decided this week that we would share some, uh, and, and from here on forward, we'll share some birthdays and anniversaries for the coming week so that you can know about those and celebrate with those who are having birthdays and anniversaries. So Joe, tell us a little bit about those. Okay, lots of birthdays. So this past week, uh, it was Kathy Vanderswag's birthday. Uh, Rolly Rodenizer's birthday. It was so good. Uh, we got a lot of people to drive by his house in their cars. Got to see him face to face, which mm. was so nice. Um, you look so good, Rolly. Happy birthday. It was so good to see you. Uh, Elliot Wittick turns one this past week. I just can't believe you're one. So happy birthday, buddy. And Paul Mailman, I think it's your birthday today. Happy birthday. And then upcoming this week, there's Carter Hobbelt, Mary Brunt, Lillian Knickel, Malaya Robar, and Josie Monroe. So happy birthday to everybody. Yeah, awesome. Happy mm-hmm. birthday, guys. Uh, what about anniversaries, Jody? Okay, so they were all this past week as well. And there was Jason and Rachel, Nick and Mandy, and Mike and Rochelle. So happy anniversary to all of you couples. Yeah, and special happy anniversary to Jason and Rachel because you were supposed to be mentioned last week and we didn't get you in there. So <laughs> my apologies for that. Actually, I'm pretty sure it was Pastor Nathan's fault. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we're uh, moving our Zoom prayer gathering from Sunday nights to a midweek opportunity. Uh, We decided to do that because we felt like we had everything going on Sunday and we wanted to sort of separate those things and give you a little bit more opportunity to interact with each other at another opportunity through the week. So we're moving that till Thursday night at 7 p.m. So hopefully that works for everybody. We've run it by a lot of you. And uh, so we'd love to have you gather with us after work or after a long day. It would be great to gather together to pray and have a precious time seeking the Lord in his word and uh, in prayer. And so join us this Thursday, not tonight. There won't be a gathering tonight, but this Thursday at 7 p.m. Joe, do you have a scripture for us today? Yeah, uh, two. The first one is Psalm 51, verses 1 to 2. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. And the second one is Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hmm. His mercies, compassions new every morning. We trust that you're experiencing that even in this very moment, this very morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you have been so kind, so tender-hearted, so merciful, so compassionate, so full of grace towards us, undeserving sinners as we are. And we know our own sinfulness. We know our own tendencies, our own flaws and failures. We know our own bents and brokenness. And though it is great, we have a great Savior. Thank you for your grace and your love toward us as we think about that, sing about that, remark about that, speak about that, listen to that this morning in your word and in song. Would that have an effect on us to know that we are loved, to know your personal merciful touch upon our lives and then to grow in that grace as it's extended outward to others. Do a good work in us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One, two, three, four. Joyful, joyful we adore you Sadness 
the joy of living, ocean depths of happy rest. You are the one who saves. You are the one who saves. You are the one who saves. Lift us from the grave. You are the light of life. The everlasting day. You are the one who takes all our sins away. You are the one who takes all our sins away. You are the one who takes all our sins away.
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prayer, but wholly trust in Jesus. Mon espérance, sa justice est mon assurance. Il est devant Dieu mon appui. Je n'en veux point d'autre. In the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord, Lord of all When darkness seems to hide His face I rest on His This is Shant and Jenny Emanuel from Farconis Ministry. We are both doing quite well in our home in Hammonds Plains. I was supposed to travel to India on March 18 with two others, but the Indian government uh, cancelled our visas a uh, week before, and uh, soon all the international flights were cancelled after that and were shut down. We were planning to teach pastors 
and open a brand new church in one of the villages. But in the middle of April, we received a request from Shakti, who is our um, regional coordinator in India. He was asking if we could help provide emergency food relief to some of the poorest people who were suffering because of the lockdown in India. So after writing a letter to our donors, we were really amazed at the response. Shakti and the pastors that we support have been doing weekly food distribution as we send funds. Every $15 provides basic food for a family to eat for around 10 days. They've already helped over 500 families and we still have more funds to send. They started out by giving food to the very poorest from their own congregations and then they expanded to the non-Christians in the areas, the mission field areas around their churches. We really praise God for allowing us to make a difference in people's lives and show them the love of Christ. So we request that you pray for Shakti and the pastors who continue to uh, make this vital ministry of food distribution. Pray that they will have wisdom and health and safety. And uh, we are hoping to reach out to their congregation platform and as many as people as possible who are feeling discouraged with no church fellowship. Shakti has also asked prayers for the many of the migrant workers as they return home to their areas that this will not result in increased illness and hardships for them. Our tentative plans for the next mission trip to Nepal and India is to be in November, but we'll have to hope and see what the world situations at that point will be as time gets closer. And lastly, we'd just like to again say a big thank you to the Bridgewater Open Bible Church family for your continued prayer and financial support. Your interest in Fire Corners ministry is a real encouragement to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.
Father, that is our heart's desire, that your spirit would infiltrate into every part of our lives, every part of our thinking, every part of our passions and desires and our will, and would be guiding and directing us towards the truth of your word, to an attitude of repentance, to an attitude of obedience and trust that what you have to say is true and right and good. And we need the power of your spirit to accomplish that. We ask that you will be doing that great work in us as we approach the truth of your word. Would you work through the power of your Holy Spirit? We praise you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Romans 12, 3 to 13. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is in prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is in serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. 1 Peter 3, 8 Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Sometimes it's nice not to have to act your age, to be a little silly, to act a little foolish, to sort of free yourself from the constraint of having to act like an adult, to be serious all the time, to laugh like a kid. Of course, we can't stay like kids forever. We all have to grow up. We can't throw temper tantrums like a two-year-old forever, or at least we shouldn't. We can't have violent mood swings like a young teenager when we're 50 or 60. Or at least we shouldn't. Yes, every one of us must, in fact, grow up. We call it maturity. We all know that person who hasn't really grown up quite yet, don't we? But what does that mean exactly, to grow up? Does it mean that my hair turns gray? No, that only means you're getting older, not necessarily any wiser. I know a few white-haired individuals who are still pretty immature. Signs of aging do not necessarily mean we are showing signs of maturing. How do you tell if you're more mature, mature uh, this year than last year? Has living the last 12 months of your life made any difference? We all know we're getting older. But how do we know we're growing up? Wouldn't it be nice if there was some way of checking that? Well, our text today, just one verse, 1 Peter 3 and verse 8, is one of those kind of checklists. There are five features here. You can check yourself, your own heart, against this list. There are five features, five characteristics of a mature Christian. None of us will have all of them down perfectly, but the idea is, am I growing? Am I progressing more and more into the image of Christ? I look less and less like Jeff Woodcock every day and more and more like Jesus. Now, wouldn't that be something? They all spring from a heart of love. So the way I picture it is like a hand with five fingers. And these are the five fingers of an outstretched hand each with its own uniqueness, and yet when used all together are powerful expressions of the love of God to others. Notice in chapter 3, verse 8 of the 
the book of 1 Peter, he says, finally. Finally, that brings an end to this sort of section that Peter has written for those of us living in this world that is not our home. A difficult world, full of sin and injustice and cruel treatment for Christians. He has labored really well to explain to us what it looks like for Christians to live under unjust governments and harsh masters and unbelieving husbands. And now he's going to give us one final category, dealing with each other inside of the church. Notice he says, finally, all of you. See, the previous instructions were for for specific groups of people, citizens, slaves, husbands, wives. But now this is for everyone, all of us, everyone in the church, every believer of Jesus Christ. These are the five fingers of outstretched love. Finger number one, harmony. Now, I'm not a huge Greek words guy, but I think in a section like this where you're really trying to figure out the nuances and meanings of each word and what intent Peter would have had in writing those words, it's good once in a while to dive into the deep end to see what's under the surface. This is such an occasion The word here used in the New King James Version for be of one mind is the word homophrone, which literally means having the same mind. And it could be taken to mean that we all believe the same things. And I would argue that it is important that we have some major doctrines to which we all ascribe the deity of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, the gospel, the inerrancy of the scriptures, the second coming of Christ. Now, there's a lot of things that we can disagree on and differ on, but there are some major doctrines that we simply must agree upon or you're not a Christian. You're not one of us. But I think this implies something even beyond belief and doctrine. All of these commands in 1 Peter 3, 8 are attitudes, they're emotions. These are things we want to fight for, to ask God to grant to us in our spirit. This term speaks of oneness of heart, similarity of purpose, and a desire to want to to agree with each other, to want to find commonality. This is the attitude. It's not out there looking for trouble, looking for points of disagreement, looking for ways to separate and call people out and divide. And you you go over there. You're, You're not one of us. This is an attitude that tries very hard to work together for the glory of God. That doesn't seek to point out differences, but works to use each one's strengths and gifts to further the kingdom of God. Some have used the word unity to describe this. Now, unity is not some things. It is first not uniformity, where everybody looks and acts exactly the same. We're not looking for clones out here. There will be differences of style and dress and haircuts. People with different personalities and introverts and extroverts. Some that sing very well. Others that sound like wounded animals. Lots of differences among the people of God. Unity is not uniformity. We don't all look the same, act the same, think the same. Unity is also not unanimity. In other words, not everyone's going to agree on everything at all times. We all have opinions and preferences. Well, I wouldn't do it this way. Well, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, I wouldn't do it at all. And I would just say that most church squabbles do not happen over the scriptures. They don't happen over doctrinal issues. They happen over trivial things. Preference issues. I like the new stuff. I want to sing the song in my church that I heard on the radio yesterday. Well, I like the stuff we've been singing for decades now. The stuff that was written before the radio was even invented. And that's okay. Both of those are okay. But to understand that that is not a matter of right or wrong, good and evil, but a matter of personal preference. What you like. And not to force someone else or judge someone else based upon that. 
The word I have chosen to use is the word harmony. Think about harmony for a second. One of the things that I've missed about this time apart is congregational singing. I miss your voices. Maybe not every individual voice, but certainly collectively, all together, making such a great sound to the Lord. I miss the strength and volume and intensity with which you sing to Christ but we're not always singing the same notes, are we? Now, that might be reasons beyond your control, but those of us who can sing parts while everyone else is singing melody together, all the same notes, we call that unison. By the way, unison, unity is also not unison, doing everything all together at the same time. See, those of us who sing parts, we call that singing harmony, tenor, bass, alto, baritone. And we're doing that because there is, listen, something specifically beautiful about hearing notes that are, listen, completely different, but work together. Did you hear that? Harmony, completely different, but work together. And harmony is hard. A few weeks ago, uh, I heard some voices singing upstairs in our home. And I walked up the stairs only to hear our girls trying to, four of them, trying to sing harmony, trying to learn to sing a note that's just slightly above your note and make it sound like it sounds good. And it's tough. It's not easy. And I got out the camera and, and, and started to kind of record on my phone a little bit. And, and it, some of it was good and some was not as good. And what a treat to watch people try and sing different notes and make them blend and make it work into something beautiful. See, harmony is hard, but harmony is also healthy. And when people think differently and come from different backgrounds, and have different abilities and giftedness, when they come together with solidarity of purpose, we want to worship God together. We want to get the gospel out together. We want every corner of this world to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior together. When you are absorbed with the same vision, smaller, more trivial differences can be set aside. That's the beautiful thing. Far better than each of us just singing our own note, doing it together. Paul said in Philippians 1.27, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with what? One mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's the heart. This is your attitude. I will, I will give here. I will lay down my rights here. I don't have to get my own way here for the sake of the greater purpose. Philippians 2.2 2 goes on to say, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. People like this cannot even fathom division or mutiny within the local church. So let's have enough of the individual, individuality and self-interest, and let's grow up to something far better. And that's the first finger of outstretched love in the local church, harmony. Finger number two is sympathy. Notice the text says, uh, having compassion for one another. Sympathy is when other people's pain makes you feel pain. When other people's sadness makes you feel sad. When other people's happiness makes you feel happy. And when that happens easily, not forced, but it just grows within you, flourishes within you, you know at that moment you're maturing into Christ's likeness. The Greek word sympathies just sounds exactly like our English word and means literally, listen, to feel with. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, Jesus is our great example in this as our great high priest. As Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 15 says, he sympathizes with our weakness. That means he enters into our suffering. He knows how we feel. 
when Paul talked about this, he did so by using the illustration of the human body. And that we as a church are like a body with many members. And that not all have the same roles. There are some ears and some noses and some feet and some fingers. But all are crucial. We need every part. And if every part suffers, if one part suffers rather, he writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Hmm. This is seeking someone else's good where we enter into each other's needs and concerns. We feel the things that they are feeling, whether joy or sorrow. One of the other things I miss so much about gathering with the church is greeting you at the door after a service. And there's really nothing like that experience. On any given Sunday, I could greet upwards of 200 people at our door, maybe 60 or 70 different households. And during that 30 or 40 minute window of opportunity, man, the full range of emotions that can be expressed. Pastor, that was a great sermon. I just love that. I'm just loving my life right now. Everything's going great. Next, pastor, would you pray for me? I just found out I got to go to Go to the doctor. I got to have a scan this week. Pastor, I'm so fed up with my job and how I'm treated there. And I just want to quit. And, I, and, I, and, I, and they make me do this. And I don't. Pastor, we just became grandparents this week. Pastor, I just lost my mom this week. On any given Sunday, you can be pulled in a hundred different emotional directions and maybe even more exhausting than the exhaustion of preaching to the church is the exhaustion of feeling with the church and yet that's what we're called to do for each other remember peter says all of us not just the pastor not just the elders all of us are called to this to enter into life with to feel with each other by the way you cannot do this alone You can't do it without a local church, a local body of believers to call your own. You can't have someone feel with you and you can't feel with someone else when you're alone. And that's a very crucial part of life as human beings, sharing life. The secret of sympathy lies in relating so closely to someone else that we begin to feel what is happening to them is something as though it were happening to us. True sympathy doesn't have to say anything. In fact, We often think it's good if you say, oh, I know how you feel. But if you really did know how they felt, you probably wouldn't say it. Because you would know in that moment that saying that is something that they don't need to hear. Sometimes the best sympathy is just simply to be present. It takes time. Finger number three, outstretched love fraternity. Notice it says love as brothers. You know this Greek word well. Philadelphos. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, although it doesn't always act like that. But we, the church, are to act like that. Romans 12.10 says, for example, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in giving Uh, in honor, giving preference to one another. In the English Standard Version for this verse, it says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. And as a competitive kind of guy, that strikes me the right way. Oh, you think you're loving? Man, Man, I'll see your love and I'll outdo that love. Outdo one another in showing honor. This is family love. This is the kind of love you feel within the context of a human family. Brother, sister, parent. This is not second-rate love. This love is not cheap. It's not easy. It's not descriptive of the red punch social in the church basement on a Sunday night. This love is strong and loyal. It sticks up for one another. It looks out for one another. It says, no matter what happens, I'm with you. I'm for you. We're in this together. 
You and I are family, brothers, sisters. I think of my own flesh and blood family over the years, and there's been some fairly substantial quarrels over the years amongst us, and yet there is nothing that would ever be so severe enough to break our family apart. If you need me, I will be there. This is not the first time Peter has called for this through thick and thin kind of love. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, he had said previously, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Paul told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 3.12, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another, that, that they should love the brothers more and more, increasingly. Hebrews 13.1 says, let brotherly love continue. Perhaps Jesus said it best in John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It's amazing that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Family, brothers and sisters, under the same father, fraternal love. Finger number four, pity. Notice the term, be tender-hearted. I kind of laughed to myself when I read the old King James Version of this. By the way, I love the King James Version, grew up with the King James Version. But the King James Version says here, literally, be pitiful. <laughs> I thought that was great. And I know what they mean. I know they mean feel pity for someone. But I just like that it said be pitiful, which is not hard for most of us these days. Am I right? I mean, I'm pretty pitiful. But that's not what Peter is telling us to be. This term is used in Ephesians 4.32 where it says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. It's heartfelt compassion. There's a quickness here, a sensitivity, quick to feel, quick to show affection and kindness. In the book Character Above All, which is a compilation of 10 essays on 10 different presidents of the United States from Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s to George Bush in the 1990s. Each essay is written by someone who knew that particular president very well. Friends, speechwriters, fellow politicians who worked alongside them and could attest to their character. In the particular chapter on Ronald Reagan, his speechwriter Peggy Noonan tells an interesting story of kindness which she prefaces by these remarks. The almost Lincolnian uh, kindness that was another part of Reagan's character, everyone who worked with Reagan has a story about his kindness. And before I tell you this story, think about that last statement for a second. Wouldn't it be great if that could be said about you and about me? Everyone who worked with Jeff has a story about his or her kindness. Well, the story goes like this. There was a woman by the name of Frances Green, an 83-year-old woman who lived by herself on social security in a town just outside San Francisco. She had little money, but for eight years, she had been sending $1 a year to the Republican National Convention. $1. One day, Francis got an RNC fundraising letter in the mail, a beautiful piece on thick, cream-colored paper with black and gold lettering. It invited recipients to come to the White House to meet President Reagan. Well, she never noticed the little RSVP card that suggested a positive reply needed to be accompanied by a generous donation. She thought she'd been invited because they appreciated her dollar-a-year support. Well, Frances scraped up every cent she had and took a four-day train ride across America. Unable to afford a sleeper, she slept sitting upright in coach. Finally, she arrived at the White House gate. Little elderly woman with white hair, white powder all over her face, white stockings, and an old hat with white netting. 
and an all-white dress, now yellow with age. When she got up to the guard at the gate and gave her name, the man frowned, glanced over his official list, and told her that her name wasn't there. She couldn't go in. Frances Green was heartbroken. It just so happened that a Ford Motor Company executive who was standing in line behind her was watching and listening to the whole scenario. Realizing something was wrong, he pulled Frances aside and got her story. Then he asked her to return at 9 a.m. the next morning and meet him right here. She agreed. In the meantime, he made contact with Anne Higgins, a presidential aide, and got clearance to give her a tour of the White House and introduce her to the president. The president. Reagan agreed to see her, quote, of course. The next day was anything but calm and easy at the White House. One of Reagan's closest advisors has, had just resigned, and there had been military uprising abroad. Reagan was in, Reagan was in and out of high-level secret sessions. But Francis Green showed up at 9 o'clock anyway, full of expectation and enthusiasm. The executive met her, gave a wonderful tour of the White House, then quietly walked by the Oval Office, thinking maybe, at best, she might get a quick glimpse of the president on her way out. Members of the National Security Council came out. High-ranking generals were coming and going. In the midst of all of that, President Reagan glanced out and saw Francis Green with a smile he gestured her into his office. As she entered, he rose from his desk and called out, Francis, those darn computers, they fouled up again. If I'd known you were coming, I would have come out there to get you myself. He then invited her to sit down, and they talked leisurely about California, her town, her life, and family. The President of the United States gave Francis Green a lot of time that day, more time than he had. Some would say it was time wasted, but those who, who say that didn't know Ronald Reagan very well. He knew this woman had nothing, listen, nothing to give him, but she needed something he could give her. And so he, as well as the Ford executive, took time to be kind. You know, in a world full of tragedy and pain where one horrific news story seems to top the last, there is the risk of becoming desensitized to it all, not being able to feel anymore. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do not grow immune to the pain that someone else feels. Have a tender heart toward that person. Even if you think they should be over it by now. Even if you've been through something far worse in your estimation. Feel. Feel for them. Feel with them. Tender is a good word here. I like that translation. Tender hearted. You know, when you get hurt, you get caught or a bruise on you somewhere and someone touches it, bumps into you. You say, ouch, that's really tender. This is a heart that is not harsh or cruel, but soft and gentle. And that's how we should be with each other. Not wanting to bump the wound, but care for it. It's an attitude that says, if I could, I would take this from you. It's the heart of a parent that sees their child laying there sick. And we say, uh, if I could, I would take that. I would, I would bear that from you. So you wouldn't have to. You know, I don't hardly ever cry on my own. I might cry once a year. But you make me watch some sappy movie. You get me in a funeral service. And even there, I'm good. As long as I can't see you crying. The moment I see you, I'm in trouble. We were watching a show this week with the kids. It was from the 80s, a sitcom. And one of the characters in that show started to cry even but for a moment and immediately I just started to lump up in my my throat and 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 tears came to my eyes and I'm telling you I'm certainly getting softer with age and perhaps it's has to do with the number of children that live in my home but by the way this is not pity that says well I feel sorry for you in some condescending way 
This is genuine, sincere feelings that move us, listen, to action. There is action involved with this tender heartedness. The Greek term literally has the idea of bowels or intestines, something internal, deep within us. We would say, man, I, I hurt for you. I feel it deeply within me. Now, some of us are so good at that. While other, others of us, like myself, we have to work at this. When someone is sharing their sorrows with us, we, we do not want to respond with compassion or empathy. We don't want to share feelings with you. We want to share truth with you. Well, if you hadn't done that, why would you say that? That's, it's really not that big of a deal. You should probably get over that. I've seen much worse. And Well, listen, here's what you should do now. Listen, listen. Sometimes the person doesn't need words. They need warmth. They don't need coaching as much as they need compassion. Stop thinking in that moment of the next thing that you're going to say. And just listen. Enter into their pain. Listen to what they're saying to you. There's a humorous story from J. Edgar Hoover's life, first director of the FBI, who was once at a reception with the president of the United States. One by one, people kept passing by, shaking hands, exchanging greetings. But nobody was really listening to what anyone else was saying in those greetings. Instead of simply replying, I'm fine, thank you, it's nice to see you. Hoover decided that he would take a different approach that evening. Fed up with the superficiality of it all, to every person that greeted him in that line that evening, he said, I killed my wife's mother last night. <laughs> Nobody said anything different to him. Just a steady stream of, oh, nice to see you too. Oh, nice to see you too. That is, until one particular foreign ambassador stopped and bowed his head and said, I'm sure the old bat deserved it. Listen. Really listen to what people are saying and go beyond the superficiality into the deep needs of people. Think the Good Samaritan. There's a man who's walking down the road who is robbed, stripped of his clothing, beaten, and left for dead. Jesus contrasts the tender care shown by the Samaritan with the calloused indifference shown by both the priest and the Levite who ignored and walked on the other side of the road. It says there in Luke 10 that a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, here, here's my credit card. When I come again, I will repay you. See, the Samaritan had compassion and was moved in his heart and didn't just say, oh, I feel sorry for you. He went to him and took action. To give, to serve, to protect, to care for. See, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a great reminder to religious people like you and me that there are many times when we see something worth having compassion for and yet we feel nothing for that person. We ignore it completely. Brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so among the family of God. And remember, Jesus is our good Samaritan, isn't he? Who had pity on us and laid down his own life for us on the cross. We have received the very compassion of Christ who himself bore our sins, suffering in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous. Harmony, sympathy, fraternity, and pity. And lastly, finger number five, humility. You say, but my New King James Version says, be courteous. Well, 
I know that the word is translated as be courteous in the New King James Version, but the word literally means to be humble in spirit, to be lowly and bowed down in your mind, in your own thinking. It's an attitude word. It's an attitude that Paul talks about in Philippians 2 verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Wow. To be humble is to suppress the desire within us to be more important and to put our interests first. Hey, aren't you glad on your hand that you have a thumb Without a thumb, there's lots of things you can't do. Kids, how would you play hours of Xbox or PlayStation? How would you men grip a a, a golf club or a hammer? Our thumbs are what make that grip strong and enhance the use of the other four fingers. Humility is like that thumb. Think back through this list. Harmony, sympathy, fraternity, pity. What happens if you strip those things of humility? What happens when you strip humility from love? How do you deeply feel something for someone else if you're only thinking about yourself? How is your compassion perceived if you only help someone because you want to be applauded as the hero that swept in and saved the day, the white knight? When you do it with pride and announcement... And, and selfie, hey, check out what I did for the world tonight, Facebook. It strips compassion of its very essence. It's no longer compassion, but has turned now into some sick form of self-serving. And I do this now to make myself feel good and to reward myself, to look good in front of all these people. So see, We desperately need humility for any of these other four Christian qualities to function. Humility is the thumb. Not false humility, not look at me, look how humble I am humility. Wayne Detzler gives the example of the difference between a prayer meeting and a church business meeting. And he says, it is so easy for us to appear humble in a prayer meeting, but church members meetings with their uninhibited debate often strips saints of pretending humility. Chuck Swindoll once said, you can fake love, you can fake patience, you can fake tolerance, you can fake wealth or poverty, but you cannot fake humility. Someone else once said, humility is the fairest flower that blooms, but display it once and it withers into pride. Nobody has ever been able to write a book on how I became humble. It's not how it works. The moment you think you're humble, you're automatically not. Peter's going to come back to this humility in the end of his letter in chapter 5 where he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your cares upon him for he, listen, cares for you. How incredible is that? Clearly, Peter had learned humility the hard way. He himself had been humbled. God had resisted him as it were. Even if all others deny you, Lord, I will never deny you. I I don't know the man. Really, Peter? Peter's pride had been crushed in that moment. His denials and the rooster's crow would forever ring in his ear. Yes, far better to humble yourself, humble like Jesus, who in that same room where uh, a Peter so proudly boasted, stooped to take a towel and a basin of water and wash each of his disciples' feet, Peter included. Humility is a willingness to do the jobs that no one else sees or will ever know about. It does the job that no one else wants to do and does it gladly because no job is beneath it. Well, it's time to grow up. We have been living in selfishness 
and self-interest for far too long. You say, how do I do it? How do I live like this? Well, first of all, look at the second half of verse 11. We'll get there next week. But the second half of verse 11 says, let him seek peace and pursue it. I love this. See, this kind of stuff, this peace, this this relational unity, it doesn't happen by accident. You're not born this way. Every single one of us must fight for this, pursue this. Pursue, by the way, is a hunting term. It means to pursue with intensity, determination, and persistence. We're going to chase this down until we get it. You say, why would I do this? Why would I lay down my personal rights? Why would I serve others and give my time and my energy? Why would I drain myself to the point of exhaustion in trying to sympathize with and show compassion to this person? Well, the answer is simply, we don't have to. We get to. The heart that has been radically transformed by the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ will respond to his great love for me by showing great love for others. Philippians chapter 2 continues in verse 5 through 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking on the form of a bondservant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's why we love our neighbor as ourself. Because we can. We couldn't before. With a heart that's full of sin and selfishness, But that heart has been broken through faith in in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now, yes, I can. Yes, I get to love my neighbor in the same ways as I love myself. The way that I myself want to be treated. The way that Jesus treated me with grace and mercy and sympathy and kindness. So let us be the hands And the feet, outstretched love of Jesus Christ to each other and to this world. God help us. This, while it sounds so pleasant, so uh, upbeat, yes, we want this, this is beautiful. Lord, we recognize that there is a tendency with all, all of us to do this in short bursts in a short window of opportunity. But what this is calling us to, I believe, is long-term kindness and sympathy and love and humility and like-mindedness. That we would do this not just for a blip, for a moment, but for the rest of our lives to grow and abound in this. This is a really crucial, crucial message for a time like this. And we have a lot of people who are suffering, sickness, financial needs, where we're apart from each other. 13 weeks as a church family apart from each other. But that's not good for any of us. So may we this week think about these five fingers of outstretched love. And may we, God help me and our church be these things this week to each other, to call each other, care for one another, speak love and encouragement to one another, to sympathize with each other's needs. But Lord, I pray that this would be ongoing. Change my own attitude from, man, I have to do this to I get to do this. Because of the grace of God that was bestowed upon me. That I could do this for you. Thank you for the privilege of serving you in this way. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the joy that resounds within our hearts. When we see and read and listen to the scripture. May we now heed it and obey it. 
In Jesus' name, amen. for the deep, deep love of Jesus Christ. The perfect, pure, sacrificial, giving love directed towards uh, his very enemies. It's incredible to think about. And without the love of Jesus, we would have no hope of being reconciled to a holy God. Uh, without the love of Jesus, we would have no hope um, in any part of our, our lives. And so we praise you and we thank you for such love. And Father, we pray 
that we would be um, so often we're in these prayers, we pray that we would be able to take what you have given and extend it to us and extend it to others for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, that people might be one to Christ as we love them with the love of Christ. So we ask that you would give us strength and, and, um, and heart to do that this week in the power of your Holy Spirit. We praise you that you will never leave or forsake us. And um, uh, we just give you all of the praise and glory for what you are accomplishing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been a joy. It's been a privilege to be able to uh, worship Christ and revel in the love of God uh, with you. And we eagerly anticipate our opportunity next week in God's will to be able to do so again. And until that time, take care.